Welcome to Wellbeing Through Design. Today's guest is Sylvie Beljanski. Sylvie Beljanski was born in New York City after her father, Mirko Beljanski, PhD, came to New York to pursue a two-year fellowship with Nobel Prize winner, Severo Ochoa. Raised and educated in Paris, she completed her undergraduate studies at the Sorbonne before being admitted to the French bar. In 1999, Miss Belgensky founded the Belgensky Foundation, a registered 501 nonprofit whose mission is to find natural non-toxic cures for cancer. She relentlessly educates the public about the effects of environmental toxins on our health and is a sort after speaker at Health and Wellness Conference globally. Ms. Belgensky is a member of NSA and is currently on an international book tour for award-winning book, Winning the War on Cancer, The Epic Journey Towards a Natural Cure. When not working, guess what? <laughs> She's still working. So work is definitely a worship for her. So welcome, Sylvie. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure being with you. You're doing such amazing work for the society. Tell us what motivates you and work is worship. I mean, this is like unheard of. So tell us more. <laughs> what motivates you? Well, what motivates me is uh, the importance of the results that we are achieving through the Belchansky Foundation. When uh, I see that we can help people fight cancer naturally and without toxicity that is so huge that I just cannot just turn off and uh, I want to do always to do more to do more kind of uh, addicted to the good things and to the wonderful scientific publications that the Belchansky Foundation has been able to uh, you know amass year after year I mean, we have like every year, we have one or two new publications. And it's it just, you know, it's wonderful for me. It's it give me kind of high. I'm ad really addicted to the good scientific papers. I think it's a, it's a socially acceptable addiction. So I <laughs> go with it. <laughs> oh, I love that definition. Socially accepted addiction. I've never heard of put those two things together, but I guess uh, that truly is your calling and uh, you are living your calling. So that's why it feels very at peace, I believe. It, it, it is. It's not easy, but uh, I love it and I would not trade it for anything else. Definitely Great. not. Recently, the last paper we had is about a plant extract called Paupera. And uh, we have uh, research is showing that it's able to help a man with uh, elevated PSA, but no prostate cancer. And there are, you know, thousands, millions of men with this kind of issue uh, around around the world and nothing much is offered to them and this paper comes and completes additional research that was done previously it was showing that the same plant extracts was also working at the, to kill cancer cells even when the cancer is very advanced so uh, that shows you know that we can help so many people it's it's exhilarating Great. How are you being well? I mean, I'm sure people would like to know people working in nonprofit with such wonderful smile. How do you maintain it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very lucky with with good genes, uh, and uh, but I, I I I there are a number of things I believe which are very important to well being. And it, me, it is to live without fear, to have a feeling that, you know, you, there is a lot to do, but you are not stressed. We don't, you don't have stressful emotions about it. it is, there is a lot to do, but we are going to get it done. Uh, and I have a feeling, I have achieved a feeling of peace 
-hmm. with myself and with what I am doing, a feeling of um, stillness in a way. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, is, this is it. I am at the right, the right person at the right place. And what, what else? I mean, to ask, to ask for more. I mean, there is kind of, yes, this, this is it. This is it. And that gives me a great sense of well-being. Of course, there are, you know, other things you, you have to maintain yourself, go to the gym, move, uh, speak to people, meet yeah. people. That's really, really important. And uh, although I work a lot, I am, I've been able to create a circle where I speak actually every day to a lot of people. And, um, and you know, if I take the time to take care of myself and go to the gym, that's, that's all I need, basically. I definitely hear um, some deep roots of meaningful work. A lot of our audience listening to this interview are working professionals and um, the studies show that 60 to 80% 80, 80 people are not happy with what they are doing every single day. So you, you kind of are refreshing to um, be on this interview who is really so satisfied with her work. Indeed, and I know I, how lucky I am. Look, it has not always been the case. It started really uh, in a not easy, easy way. I don't have a scientific background. I am a, I'm a lawyer by trade. I was raised, uh, I was born in New York, but raised in, in France, and uh, I went to law school in, in France. And uh, what happened, uh, as, as you, you know, you, you explained, my father was a scientist molecular biology, he was at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, uh, France, and he was one of the first scientists to be really at the forefront of what is now known as environmental medicine. Mm -hmm. And he came up with those um, natural extracts uh, which are able to destroy cancer cells that are not gender or organ specific. And he became kind of famous with those extracts in France back in the 80s. And uh, in the early 90s, uh, former uh, president François Mitterrand uh, was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. And uh, the surgeon came to the equivalent of the you know, French White House, diagnosed the president uh, and said, the president is not going to finish his second term. The cancer has spread everywhere. But Mitterrand had a mistress who knew about a good doctor who had good results because he was using of my, fa my father's products. And uh, then uh, he, the, the good doctor so knew about my, my father's products and uh, he started to um, give uh, to the former president, François Mitterrand, the plant extracts. And against all odds, Mitterrand started to get better and better and finished his second term. Wow. But you know, when uh, somebody who is not ready for the political limelight suddenly uh, comes under the radar of, at the highest level yeah. of the country, uh, there is a lot of things you are not prepared for. Okay. And actually, a few months after Mitterrand finally passed away, uh, there was a backlash. The, they sent the, the army, the army, a SWAT team, to uh, destroy my father's laboratory, to arrest oh. him, to arrest my mother. They came with machine guns, with, with dogs. With, I mean, it was nothing, nothing normal. I mean... Being a lawyer, you know, I got prepared for litigation or whatever, but definitely not uh, machine guns coming to shut down a laboratory and arrest a man in his 70s. Wow. So uh, that's where I, I started to, to get involved. Uh, what, what happened is I was calling, uh, I was calling my, my father from time to time. I was, you know, working in a law firm in New York. I had been, uh, because I am American, born in New York, 
I got this job with a law firm here and I was lonely, you know, the first year here, I was lonely. It's difficult. You don't know anybody. Yes. New York is not easy. <laughs> Uh, and I was calling home on a regular basis. And one day I called home and the telephone is ringing, ringing, ringing. And it's, my father was passionate about his, his work. I mean, he was always in, in the lab. And uh, I thought there was some, something strange. I decided to call home and speak to my mom. And I hear a voice like that. I said, Mom? You cannot speak to your mother. She's under arrest. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I just even, don't even thought of it twice. I said, I'm a lawyer. I want to speak to my mother. And they gave me, okay, they gave me five minutes to speak with my client. Uh-huh. So that's how I started to get involved into what my parents were doing for the wow. first time. And I started with, you know, as, as a lawyer. Then I was digging into the file what I discovered that there was a really, um, a real effort from the government to destroy everything, to destroy evidence and destroy testimonials. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's what's not, you know, the law is about. Yes. They are supposed to keep evidence for trial, not destroy them before trial. And then my father, uh, time was dragging, dragging, dragging. And my father, for two years, never got his day in court. Oh. They never gave him the opportunity to defend himself. And, and my fa father finally died. Um, and I decided to, to carry on. I said, this, is, this cannot be allowed. Yeah. You cannot kill the defendant to get rid of a case. Exactly. There is no trial, no trial date. What do you do? You, I mean, you, you write motions, petitions that, that to no, nobody ever answers and never gives them a, a date to go to court. Oh. And for such an accomplished person who is kind of like really that, inventing a cure. That, was, that really killed him. And after he passed away, first, the first thing I did was to take the case to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And we won an unanimous decision. But then for, I knew for that, you know, for my father as a scientist, the most important was scientific recognition. Yes. That was what most important to his well-being. I mean, at this time of his, his, of his life was that, mm -hmm. you know, his work made sense and could help a lot of people. So I decided to continue that and, and, and be able to provide this, the well-being to those people once my father was no longer there. Mm -hmm. for, to do so. So I started this foundation in 99 in New York, a non-for-profit. Uh, and I decided, not being a scientist, that what I would do is create partnerships with, uh, with um, scientific institutions and have them work on my father's plant extracts and confirm mm -hmm. that it was going, that they were actually effective against different kinds of cancer cells. So over the years, we have been working with Columbia University on prostate cancer uh, and with Kansas University on ovarian and pancreatic uh -huh. cancer and showing that, you know, it was always working alone and in synergy with different kinds of chemotherapies. It was not gender or organ specific. It was, it was non-toxic. And we have, you know, created this body of work that I'm so happy now it now it has become my calling to mm -hmm. share this information and it made me just as happy as it made my father happy at the time that is some amazing example first i want to acknowledge being a wonderful daughter who has carried on the legacy in the right way because this matters to the world as, and of course matter to your father for sure but 
this is amazing to know that there could be a cure and that too plant-based. So that leads me to my next question, which is tell us more. I mean, is this from what little I know coming from India is there is something called Ayurveda, uh, Absolutely. Which, is what, which is what I'm exposed to, which was introduced to me as like a plant-based uh, medicine. So is this along those lines? I mean, I don't, I don't know more about your medicine. So tell us more. Well, the, the philosophy is a little bit different from Ayurveda because uh -huh. this is really, uh, you know, very, this plant extract, but studied in a very Western way. Okay. Uh, with, you know, mice and how the, the oh, okay. measuring the size of the tumor and the shrinking of the tumor and publications about those, those kind of results. However, one of the uh, plants my father uh, has been working with and we continue to work with is Revolfia vomitoria, which is coming, uh, I mean, has been very largely used uh, in India at the time, it is actually reported that Gandhi was using it uh -huh. uh, to calm himself down and, uh, and sleep better. Yes. So uh, we are using this plant, but there is a special treatment to the extracts that we are uh, doing. We are removing the reserpine. Revolfia vomitoria is known for the reserpine and uh, lowering hyper hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you remove the reserpine, you also remove the potential toxicity of the plant. And what is left is another alkaloid called alstonine, and which mm -hmm. has wonderful anti-cancer properties. Oh, so wow. there is a link with India, but a twist. <laughs> this is my 11th year of being cancer-free, and I was one of those stage four given 30 days to live. It feels like a home run to me. Almost, I, I feel elated to know that there is actually uh, studies, evidence, and some sort of cure to this deadly disease where it's really unpredictable. I mean, I just feel lucky to have survived this, um, but a lot of people go through this and it really wrecks their life. It is, it is, but obviously you, you, you have the right attitude and the right outlook and the those of optimists that uh, help make a big difference. Yeah, like I, I just, I don't know why, but I had no choice. Like my entire life was coming down. It wasn't just the disease. So I think um, I just went with the extreme. But tell us more about, I mean, you being a lawyer in New York City, right? Being an immigrant. Has there ever been situations where things, people, situations, work environment affected your well-being and you had to kind of stand up for yourself? Oh, absolutely. Uh, ab absolutely. Well, as I told you, I mean, the work environment when I decided to pursue uh, this line of work, it was extremely stressful. I did not know anything about it except that the French gov government didn't, didn't want those extracts. Uh, wow. to, to, to flourish and, and continue. And I had, did not have the background. I did not have the funding. Uh, it, it was extremely, extremely stressful. And in order to pursue it seriously and to, to, to dive into it, I had to give up my legal career. I had worked so much for. So, you know, you don't... It, it, so it was a very difficult choice mm -hmm. uh, at the time, but it felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. And I knew that I was, you know, giving up some things that I had really worked hard to obtain. I did not know what exactly, if I would be successful with my new choice, yeah. but I knew that I would, if I did not give a chance to the process, I would always regret it. Wow. And that's why I, just like you said, I had no choice. <laughs> that's exactly, exactly how I felt when I made this very difficult decision to give up my legal career. And yeah. then years later, I also chose to end up uh, 
difficult marriage, mm -hmm. which was a toxic really relationship. Uh, and it was also extremely difficult because I, even though I was not happy, I wanted, I was hopelessly yeah. uh, trying to make it work uh, for far too long. And I was, it was ex impossible to carry on and so difficult to end it. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no, no, every, everywhere I, I turned, it was going to be difficult. But uh, now it has been several years and I'm very glad uh, that I ended up at this toxic relationship, which was not going anywhere. So listening to my example and two of your examples, taking leap of faith is the only choice. And sometimes we regret and we pay a price when we don't take the leap of faith. Yes, but, uh, but not taking it at some times seems even worse. Uncomfortable, but still attached state. That's when I think we all kind of end up not happy with the results because you, you're dying in, inside you're dying and you I, just don't put it out exactly there. and and when you die that's you know that's where there is no more well-being happiness and life yeah. absolutely it is one is the opposite of the other find what your purpose is and live in alignment with it it is this alignment i believe of your values your heart uh, your, your engagement that gives sense to everything and this sense transformed itself into well-being at every level, emotional, physical, and uh, eventually even uh, financial. So I can definitely see there is a lot of self-work that has gone into you being who you are right now and certainly talking to a transformed person because your insights are quite deep. Take it a little further, because right now we are living in a society where there is a lot of suffering. Anxiety, depression. People are just not happy, regardless of where they are, which part of the world. So tell us more about how can some of those great insights that you shared help people going through it? Well... I see people, you know, they, they, work, they work in front of a computer all day long. They go home, they go into an, another screen, TV or, or social media, uh, and there is very little uh, interaction with other people, uh, very little connection. They are alone with themselves and with their fears. And there are two big emotions, you know, the fear and love. Uh, and if you don't have connections with other people, you don't feel the love. So all you can feel is the fear. And then there is no, no, no room for any, any happiness. So my very advice, you know, would be uh, to, to, to turn off the computer, go out and meet real people. Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook friends do not count as friends. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, they don't. Uh, and, and when people, you know, are very lonely, they are so desperate for mm -hmm. um, connections that they lose all sense of uh, restraint and dignity and are just desperate just, you know, to, to make themselves available for any, any encounter that, you know, is meaningless and... Uh, and that cannot lead to happiness. It can only lead to more despair and a sense of loss of who you are. Yes, sure, definitely. I think that is great, great advice and uh, insight that people listening to this can take, um, them, take it back with them. One thing I noticed, based on whatever I little learned about you, how do you manage stress? It's, it's really the, the feeling of being the right place at the, the right person at the right moment and at the right place. That's what really gives me, gives me feeling good about what I am doing. 
plus I try to go to the gym on a regular basis, have some activity, physical activity, and uh, I uh, meet with a lot of people. And I think this uh, human interaction on a regular basis and feeling that I can make a difference uh, is what helps me a lot and supports me a lot, uh, making a difference. It's not about so much about me, you know, it's not that I am, uh, I'm not that much self-centered anymore. I am so much more interested in what I am doing and in sharing with other people. And every time that, you know, we are hosting an event at Maison Belgensky, we have monthly events called Healthy Tuesdays, and I get, you know, to give a presentation or so on, it gives me such a kick, such, such a pleasure. It's kind of, you know, uh, kind of high. I'm happy with that and I'm happy to see how people are responding. So this happiness is what keeps me, you know, up and running. What kind of hope do you want to impart to the world, to the society, people going through it? Well, I think it's important to let people know that there are solutions out there which are non-toxic. And they can, you know, safely try if it's that works for them. They can look at the scientific papers. They can download them for free. They can bring that to their doctors. They can start a different conversation and, and, and get better. What I am saying always to people is that, you know, a few uh, pills of plant extract can help you at the cellular level but it will give you time. But the most important is what are you doing with this time? And you have to do the nutritional work, the lifestyle work, and most even importantly, the emotional work to make the most of the time which is, is given to you to really transform your life and get to another level of, of health, emotional health, and physical health. They go together. You cannot expect to address one level without addressing the other. You will get nowhere yes. in between. <laughs> so that kind of supports uh, my argument. I personally make no scientific evidence only because I went through it, is cancer is really a psychosomatic disease. It has physical, but more of emotional, mental implications as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There are a lot of studies, actually, that uh, show a cor correlation between uh, stress and cancer. And it's not that much about the stress itself, but how you respond to mm -hmm. the stress. And that's why some people will develop cancer in some situations and others won't. They will yeah. actually make stronger mm -hmm. by the difficulty. But some people will not be able to cope well for many reasons, which may have you know, to do with their immune system or other things. And, and they will then start to not process well the multiplication of the DNA, and there will be the beginning of uh, abnormal cells that we, that we grow. So we can, we can physically uh, prevent the duplication, abnormal duplication of the DNA. Mm. But if, if the mind is not properly connected, if the, if the cause of the problem is not solved, then the problem at the physical level will continue. Is this plant-based medicine kind of uh, replacing the traditional uh, chemotherapy, uh, or is it, is it in combination? So, I mean, we have seen now people for the past 15 years between, 50 years between my father and yes. myself. So we have seen everything. We have seen people saying, you know, I don't want to take anything poisonous. I don't want to hear about chemotherapy. And, and research shows that the product can work by itself. And we have seen people saying, you know, give me everything. I want, I, want, I want everything to help me beat this monster. And the research shows also that there is a nice synergy of action 
between chemotherapies and we have tested with different kinds of chemotherapies like gemcitabine or carboplatin. Every time we have a very nice synergy of action with the plant extracts and the chemotherapy. So people can really have, have it both ways. They don't have to, to choose uh, according to research. But there is a way and do not give up is my side of hope that I just want to share with the audience listening to this. So thank you so much, Sylvie. This is really amazing um, and refreshing to see you doing such wonderful work. Uh, best wishes for your foundation. Keep spreading the goodness. And um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them below or email them uh, at info at radhakalaria.com. If this message has resonated, I invite you to please like, share, subscribe, or follow. Until next time, have a fabulous day.